I am a person of honor, even if my station is not. Even if I were the last one left in this wretched place, I would remain a lady. Welcome to Miss Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 LGBTQ plus period dramas of all time. What do you tell folks when they ask you what went wrong with your marriage? I tell you, you drowned in still waters. And you're scared of the cops. I'm just discreet. I know a lot of people. If they see me, I could lose my job. Oh, you're one of those. Et quand vous êtes embarrassé, vous mordez vos lèvres. For this list, we'll be looking at films set primarily before 1980 that examine and invent queer history. Number 10, Desert Hearts. I'm sure no one accuses you of playing it safe. Only because they don't really know me. New Yorker Vivian meets Carefree Kay, a lesbian artist in 1959 at a Nevada ranch for women taking advantage of the state's speedy divorce process. So how long were you with Daryl? Not long. What happened? I allowed myself to get attracted to his attraction for me. Vivian unexpectedly falls for her new friend, but will the relationship survive her impending return home? Helmed by lesbian director Donna Deitch, the film overcame fundraising difficulties to become a classic of LGBTQ plus cinema. It broke ground for its time period by refusing to make a gay love story tragic. If that weren't enough, its release marked the first time a mainstream gay sex scene was directed by a lesbian. A classic love story with a twist, it opened doors for generations of filmmakers to come. Number 9, Heavenly Creatures. Juliet is joining us from St. Margaret. And prior to that, you spent some time at Queenswood in the Hawke's Bay. I am actually from England, Miss Stewart. Of course. Writing partners Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh based this psychological drama with horror and romantic elements on a real-life murder case in New Zealand. Set in the early 1950s, the film debuted Kate Winslet and Melanie Linsky as teenagers who develop an intense bond based around vivid fantasies. It is indeed a miracle one must feel that two such heavenly creatures are real. The girls stop at nothing to be together in their dreamlike world, with tragic consequences. With a deeply researched script that consulted the real girl's former schoolmates, the film comments on class differences, medical homophobia, and fantasy as a coping mechanism. It was wonderful, heavenly, beautiful, and ours. Its depiction of a twisted rebellion against 1950s repression makes it one of the genre's most unforgettable flicks. Number 8, Bessie. This biographical film stars Queen Latifah as blues icon Bessie Smith. Lord, this mean old engineer, cool as he could be. It traces the singer's legendary career arc from securing a spot on Ma Rainey's traveling tour to turbulent romances with both husband Jack and lover Lucille. Marry me. With acclaimed performances by Latifah, Michael K. Williams, and Monique, this musical biopic went on to become HBO's most watched original movie ever. White folks in the South don't care how close you get as long as you don't get too big. And white folks in the North don't care how big you get as long as you don't get too close. It introduced a new generation to Smith's genre-defining art, but also brought attention to an often ignored part of her legacy. I want a family. Like you. For those interested in learning more about blues legends and queer pioneers alike, there's no better history lesson. Number seven, Brokeback Mountain. Jack Twist. Ennis. You folks just stop at Ennis? Delmar. Well, nice to know you, Ennis Delmar. Spanning the years 1963 to 1983, Ang Lee's sprawling romantic drama about a pair of star-crossed cowboys who just can't quit each other is hailed by many as a landmark in queer cinema. 
a turning point not simply due to its critical and commercial success, but also because it helped push LGBTQ films into the mainstream. Brokeback Mountain features universal themes of loneliness, repression, and intolerance. You got your wife and baby in Texas, and you know, I got my life in Riverton. Although neither of its lead actors identified as queer, the chemistry between off-screen friends Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal is a highlight of this period drama. I wish I knew how to quit you. Then why don't you? Number six, Milk. I want to recruit you for the fight to preserve your democracy. Brothers and sisters, you must come out. This biopic dives into the final decade of Harvey Milk's life and his hard-fought battle to become California's first openly gay elected official. Harvey, what's with all this political activist crap? I mean, I thought you were a goddamn Republican. I'm a businessman, Scott, and businesses should be good to their customers, even if their customers are gay. Besides his legislative efforts to protect San Francisco's LGBTQ communities throughout the 1970s, the film examines Milk's romantic relationships and his conflicts with a conservative colleague. Harvey, society can't exist without the family. We're not against that. You're not? What, can two men reproduce? No, but God knows we keep trying. <laughs> Not everyone agreed with Sean Penn's casting as a gay icon, but the film honoured its San Francisco setting, drawing on local archives and featuring landmarks like the Castro Theatre. Although the story is undeniably tragic, it's a touching tribute to the city of the Golden Gate Bridge and the ways Milk transformed it. My brothers and sisters, we can come home again. Yeah. Number five, Gods and Monsters. So the rumours are true then? What rumours have those been? That you were forced to retire because of um, a sex scandal. Borrowing its title from a line in 1935's Bride of Frankenstein, this semi-fictional biopic focuses on the life of that film's out-gay director, James Whale. After being reportedly forced out of the industry due to his sexuality, Whale reflects on his legendary movie career and wartime trauma while taking an interest in his much younger gardener. Making movies is the most wonderful thing in the world. Working with friends, entertaining people. Yes, I suppose I miss it. But I chose freedom. Gay actor Sir Ian McKellen and his co-star Lynn Redgrave garnered acclaim for their portrayals of the artistic mastermind and his disapproving housemaid. His sins of the flesh will keep him from heaven. The oh, hell, everybody's got those. No, his is the worst. Besides speculating on Wales' final days as he deals with medical issues and a growing crush, the film spotlights the partially hidden gay circles of 1950s Hollywood. Number four, Carol. Therese Balavant. That's lovely. And yours? Carol. Carol. Adapted from Patricia Highsmith's celebrated novel, The Price of Salt, Todd Haynes' film tells the story of a photographer who finds love in an unexpected place. I like that. While working as a department store clerk in 1950s Manhattan, Therese Bellavette meets Carol, a mother whose soon-to-be ex-husband is seeking to obtain custody by exposing her sexuality. The film was nearly abandoned in development, partly due to its focus on two lesbian main characters, but received rave reviews upon release. Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara's electric chemistry even birthed a Carol fandom. Oh, that's divine. Smell that. The film's depiction of how mid-century conformist attitudes and homophobia challenge a budding romance makes it one of the genre's most bittersweet outings. Dearest, there are no accidents and he would have found us one way or another. Number three, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. This film from French director Céline Sciamma was the first helmed by a woman to win the Queer Palm at Cannes Film Festival. Set in the late 1700s, it flashes back to painter Marianne's affair with the subject of her most prized painting, a young noblewoman reluctant to marry. As Marianne falls in love, her muse's betrothal to an Italian aristocrat 
threatens their future. Amidst gorgeous coastal scenery, this cerebral film explores the visual sense and how looking can become loving. Although impossible love is a well-worn trope in queer film, this touching drama is a must-see entry in the canon. Number two, Olivia. But you have a bit of a One of the most controversial releases of its kind during its time, this French film adapted a novel that was published anonymously due to lesbian content. Est-ce qu'il s'arrête si votre main touche la sienne? Est-ce que votre voix s'étrangle dans votre gorge au moment où vous lui adressez la parole? Vraiment, Olivia, je n'éprouve rien de tout cela. Set at a boarding school for girls in the late 1800s, it introduces new student Olivia to a female-driven world filled with jealousy and affection. From the ambiguous history between the school's headmistresses to the protagonist's growing obsession with her superior, it's one of the earliest films with substantial lesbian representation. Its romantic plotline between student and teacher might not fly today, but considering its release date, Olivia is an incredible document of queer love. Sortez, mademoiselle. Je n'en ai guère le désir, ma pauvre enfant, mais il est des obligations auxquelles je ne puis me soustraire. Quand on s'en va pour toujours, il faut trouver le temps de prendre congé de ses amis. Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. Farewell, my queen. Leia Seydou shines as a servant crushing on Marie Antoinette. Je voulais vous poser une question. Je suis prête à répondre à toutes les questions de Sa Majesté, dans la mesure de mes petits moyens. Avez-vous déjà été attiré par une femme? Orlando, a gender-bending, century-spanning tale based on Virginia Woolf's novel. Look at me. Look. You are too serious, Orlando. Not serious enough. A Love to Hide, a tragic love story set in Nazi-occupied France. The Favourite, a black comedy subverting the gendered tropes of many period films. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, The Handmaiden. <laughs> The BBC first dramatised Sarah Waters' novel Fingersmith in its miniseries of the same name, but Park Chan-wook's adaptation takes its source material to new heights, transplanting the characters from 19th century England to 1930s Korea under Japanese occupation. A con man disguises Suk Hee, a girl from a poor Korean family, as a handmaiden to help swindle a Japanese heiress out of her fortune. Little does Suk Hee know, she and her mistress will develop a mutual attraction. The film is a visual spectacle, but its real draw is a tight narrative that unfolds over three epic parts. The Handmaiden boasts the best features of its genre, exploring the sexual and gender politics of its time period while delivering thrilling narrative twists. <laughs> Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.